Paolo. Um, we have been uh, working together for quite some some years, and um, uh, you, you have uh, influenced the, the scene quite a bit. And you have your e ERC Advance Grant. I think it's still ongoing. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, a, li yeah. a little bit, although with a reduced rate. <laughs> and um, I mentioned earlier ECRA 2023. And I, I would uh, like to, well, one has to credit to you that you were the one who initiated it for ECRA 2023 to come to London. So thanks for that again. I remember how we, we met in, a, in a, we were in a, in a Thai restaurant near yeah. King's College London at the time. And uh, you made the suggestion to me and uh, here we are now. So it's going to happen uh, in May next year yeah so yeah fantastic um this just on the side obviously you have also worked in in the the medical and the surgical field from the robotics perspective um uh, enormously and uh, i look forward to to seeing your presentation today well <clears throat> thank you very much Kasper. let's see if i if i can share my screen which is uh take your time which seems to be a problem uh, of course Oh, by the way, I should also ask you the question, is it OK to continue recording? Sure, 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 sure. Uh, the, 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 but I'm a little bit of difficulty here. Yes. Do you have the, the web version or the, the normal version of MS Teams? No, I have the, 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 the OK, let's see whether top, this top is. right uh, is a share button. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, we can see you, something. You see something, OK, which yep. is already a big step. Exactly. So let's try to make this one full screen. Is it okay? Fantastic. Oh, okay. Fantastic. I, I, right. I leave the floor to you. Thanks. Thank you very much, Kaspar. Thank you for inviting me. In the next, in the near future, there will be an hologram of myself on a podium somewhere there. But for the time being, we have to to be happy with this with this sort of remote presentations. So. Uh, I think that I'm presenting something different from what uh, everybody is, 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 is expecting in the sense that uh, usually as, as the previous presentation, when you talk about uh, robotic surgery, robotic instruments, so forth, you get a mixture of different uh, technologies, material, uh, objects, instruments. Uh, so it's mostly mechanical, hydraulic, uh, electronics directed. Uh, here I will do something which is basically uh, computer science, uh, logics, uh, reasoning, and things like that. On the other hand, think about industrial robots. You know, you have uh, two or three uh, lines of of, medic of of industrial robots. There are the universal robot, there is the, the KUKA, there is the Franca, and then you do everything with those same, the same, always the same robots, just changing the software. So in a sense, I think that uh, surgical robotics and medical robotics in general should go in that direction with a few standard setup to which we add the capabilities with software. So, you know, we are all used to work with this, uh, with our standard Da Vinci and so forth, but the Da Vinci is a, a teleoperation system. It, it doesn't really have uh, any intelligence, it has you know, some minimal autonomous function, is able to scale the images, uh, is able to filter the tremors. It does some fantastic work on image processing, which we haven't really been able to <laughs> reverse engineer. Uh, but you know, it's, it's, it, all the intelligence is provided by the, uh, the human operator. So what should we do? You know, uh, focusing on adding these additional features and therefore basically uh, add these new parts. You know, we, we leave out uh, what we do, why we are doing the things, what are the causes, why we're doing so. So all the reasoning that is behind a, 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 an intervention, which is usually left to the, to the surgeon, obviously left to the surgeon. But there are a number of, of actions that could be suitable for some automation and for some support to the to the to the human surgeon if you remember uh well okay these are other points you know uh, if there are no physicians what should we do if uh, the physician is remote if there is time delay between uh, the uh, intervention direct intervention of the physician and the necessity of the intervention so you know there are a number of situations where 
if the robot were able to step in by itself with some knowledge of what is going on, with some capability, then would have some benefit. So this is basically the basic of what is called cognitive robotics. This is a term that was uh, in the field of medical robotics was used, uh, was developed some 15 years ago in a workshop in, in, in Germany. And uh, you know, it, it refers to the robot that is able to include you know very well that the, the basic definition of a robot is the intelligent connection between perception and action. So the, the key is this intelligent connection. Uh, what is the intelligence that a robot can provide and how can it insert it and explain it to a human partner? So we have all these, these things that are necessary and this is the, the path that uh, we have been following in the past years. Uh, you know, the, we did uh, as, as good engineers always do. We think that we thought that the uh, operating room was more or less a, a like like a machine shop where where the the uh, the surgeon, if we were able to provide a, a very high accuracy, the surgeon would be able to do everything without problems. Of course, it was not was not the case. So we shifted a little bit on, on and this was done in the Akurobas project. Then we shifted to the Safros project, which was relating um, safety in uh, in operating room and extending this uh, the, the, the concept of accuracy to the concept of control, the concept of information sharing and so forth. So a number of steps forward. And this is our dream of what should be should be happening in the operating room. So you see, uh, we have a fixed robot, which is, you know, I put the, the picture of Da Vinci, but now we know that there are new robots coming to the market. But the whole story is based on the flow of data, you know, data science, and there is a field that is called surgical data science, which really is based on the uh, examination and learning from the data and using the data to drive the whole process. So, you know, we use the, the data, uh, preoperative medical images to make the diagnosis, but then we can use those data to make virtual models or physical models. Um, and I will try to explain later why, uh, <laughs> of course, there is a significant difference from physical and uh, virtual model. Then on these models, we can do the planning, we can do the training, we can have an interactive simulator to be able to practice the intervention before doing it. But then all this knowledge should not be lost. Currently, there is no link. You see here, I put a, 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 an arrow saying registration, but it's much more than registration. It's actually all the knowledge that is acquired doing training on, on or studying about the procedure that should be transferred to the robot and help the robot and the physician to carry out jointly the intervention. Uh, we have done a couple of uh, additional projects based on this concept. One was ISUR, in which we developed a, a robot for autonomous uh, needle insertion and uh, suturing. And then this uh, ERC grant that uh, Professor Kaspar mentioned earlier about autonomy and robotic surgery. So basically, all the... Uh, uh, oops. This, uh, adding all the uh, features to be able to uh, carry out, uh, adding all the technologies or some of the technology to, able, to be able to carry out an autonomous intervention. So basically the summary of the talk will be about the motivation of autonomy. And uh, in the title I put AI based because of course, uh, artificial intelligence is a big step, big, big component of autonomy. Although we are using, you will see artificial intelligence in a slightly different way that is uh, normally used. Uh, what are the levels? Uh, and then the scientific challenges of autonomy, which were all the, all the uh, direction of our ERC project. And each one of them of this direction had one or two PhD associated to them. So it was uh, quite an extensive endeavor to be able to carry it to the end. And then how we demonstrated and then some conclusion uh, of, the, of, the, of the talk. So, why do we want to have some autonomy? And here we have some of the reasons. Uh, you know, of course, we want to have uh, a somebody. Let's keep let's keep in mind that the key point is safety. So if something goes wrong, we want to be able that somebody intervenes during the procedure 
to correct the error, to stop it, or something like that. However, if you are using a robot, there is no way that a human can intervene. Uh, there is only one machine, as far as I know, that has some level of autonomy, which is the Accuray, which is a, a machine for uh, X-ray uh, treatment of patients with cancer. And the machine uh, uh, play, well, is planned together with the surgeon, the, the um, painting of the X-rays, because it has to be some sort of uh, complicated pattern to avoid the damaging tissues, and that it, it cannot stop too long on a certain essence to follow certain rules. But then during the execution, the machine is left on, on its own. And if the patient moves too much, if there is some unexpected event, there is no way that the human can interact interrupt the procedure. So the robot must be aware of it is what he's doing and be able to stop itself if he sees that there are conditions that are not correct. Then there is this big push, at least in Italy, toward the digital transformation of medicine. So basically getting all the data collected, all the prescriptions or the uh, clinical files. Uh, but if you really want to have an, a physical interaction with the patient, there is no way, no way that you can do it with simply uh, simple software. You need to have a robot that is able to physically interact with a human. And so again, but when you're you're doing physical interaction, you have to have safety. Robots, as as you very well know, are very powerful devices, and they have to be controlled and and, and be somehow programmed so that they are not making damages to anybody. And of course, you know, this should be done autonomously. Another point which is very, very critical is this issue of, of cost. Uh, you know, there are a number of advantages for medical robotics. Uh, it is not a silver bullet for anything, but it helps increasing the average quality of healthcare. It allows, uh, well, physical separation we have seen during the pandemics that whether that if we were able to get uh, uh, separation between sick patients and, and healthy physician, we could have done much better. Uh, it it um, you know it, it uh, reduces the learning curve. It gives uh, uh, some consistency in in uh, practice. But of course, it has some drawbacks. Uh, there are very few robots in the world. There are a few thousand surgical robots. So they say less than ten thousand robots in the world. Uh, it it has a very very limited penetration to the market. Zero point five. Of, of about 250 million major interventions that are done uh, every year in the world. And the main point is that medical robotics is too expensive. So now we are creating this robotic divide, not only between uh, emerging economies or emerging countries and established or rich countries like the Western countries, but even within uh, our countries, UK, Italy, France, there are very, very few robots. There are in Italy, there are about 80 robots. In UK, well, I don't know the number, but it's probably in the 10th. Why is that? Well, because it's too expensive. Not only the cost of, of purchasing the robot, also the cost of training the people, because it must be used with a very high uh, frequency. A, a surgeon must perform a few hundred intervention, robotic intervention every year to be able to maintain the skills, the manual and the perception skills that are needed, and therefore they have to be concentrated in uh, facilities that can ensure this large volume. And, and, and this facility can only afford to have these uh, very expensive robots. Now there are new robots coming to the market, the business model may change and so forth, but still, uh, a, a, the average uh, Da Vinci costs about 2 million euros, this, let's say 2 million pounds more or less, and uh, it costs about 500,000 euros for yearly between instruments and maintenance. So, you know, it's not only the initial purchase, but also the yearly uh, cost. We hope that autonomy can help reduce the cost because we can use uh, low cost devices. We can use plastic instead of metal. We can use economic motors, economic sensor and compensate to achieve high performance, compensate the, their lower performance with uh, intelligent control and some sort of autonomy. So self-correcting, self-adjusting type of controls. And we call this the frugal paradigm. 
uh, which we are sort of pursuing with some colleagues, especially in UK, in the Netherlands, to try to reduce the cost of these devices, which is uh, honestly driven only by uh, uh, market reasons. Otherwise, would other people say by greed reasons, but you know, let's not go that far. So the levels of autonomy, uh, this is uh, the classification that was first developed by Professor Young and, and uh, his, his colleagues when he was at Imperial College, and it's just an idea of what uh, we could do. Identify a number of levels of autonomy, six in this case, but each level can be subdivided in, in a number of sub sub levels and so forth. Uh, the zero being the Da Vinci, and one is being the cooperation between human and robot. So the robot is able to support the the physician with cognitive and manual dexterity uh, tools. To reach these levels, we have all these challenges, and uh, you will see that we have been focusing mostly in knowledge represent on knowledge representation because it's the first step that we have to do. We have to represent what we want to do. We have to develop a, a model of what we, what the intervention is. And the model should be a logical model, should be a mathematical model, should be a simulation model. You will see that there are a number of different alternatives and which one of, each one of them is complementary. It allows to uh, explore a different aspect of this, uh, of this really very difficult challenge. Uh, we have been lucky that we've been funded a number of ERC projects. Uh, ours is the major one. And then out of the ERC project, there were a, a proof of concept project, which is called PROST, I uh, hear, for, for applying autonomy to prostate biopsy. And now we got another uh, ERC uh, proof of concept uh, uh, project funded, uh, which is uh, basically the application to start to do uh, optical biopsy, uh, replacing the actual extraction or sampling of the tissue with a, a, a OCT, which is optical coherent tomography that allows to visualize the cells and so getting the diagnosis without uh, sampling of the tissues. But you know, that will be the, the topic of a future presentation. So let's, let's focus now on ours. And uh, uh, these are the project objectives. Uh, you see, uh, the um, ERC projects are very interesting in the sense that uh, th they are not as formal as a regular uh, European projects. You have to give direction of your research, but you are free to explore the different aspects of this, uh, uh, this research. And you will see that uh, we have discovered the things that we were not considering at the beginning, and they prove to be very important, but this is what happens when you do research. So, you know, we have developed to develop uh, models, to do the plans, to do the real-time controls, basically to arrive to a demonstration of these technologies. And we have done one at the middle of the project. Hopefully, by the end, we'll be able to do a new demonstration. Uh, here, the last point, which uh, just popped out, uh, addresses social and ethical aspects. Um, this is very important because uh, we really don't know what are the what is the impact on the perception of people when we, we tell them that they will be operated by an autonomous robot. So now I'm organizing a whole number of, of uh, focus groups with patients, with physicians, with philosophers, with religious people to get different point of view, to get the, 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 the uh, feedback on whether this technology will, will encounter some difficulties, how can we explain, how make it uh, um, more appealing to people, uh, whether it is has to be useful or not. So there are a number of which have social and ethical implication that we need to address when we, we are dealing with such a complex and, and sort of un unsettling technology. This, well, this is a project. This is the experiment that we did in the first time. We had the uh, Da Vinci Research Kit and we did the first um, task that is given to a, a, a surgeon in training, which is just to pick up rings and put them on a, uh, appropriate uh, pegs of the same color. And you will see how we did. And of course, the robot was able to do everything autonomously, knowing the task that he had to do. He developed a plan, reacted to unexpected events, and so forth. How do we get there? Well, we could do this knowledge representation using textbook information, interviews to the sur surgeons, uh, sort of learning from what is done and clinical data analysis. We call the first two parts as top-down knowledge, 
this is just transfer learning and this is bottom up knowledge. So we can learn from the established knowledge, the textbooks as, as we the first thing that we do and also from the uh, by examining the data that are collected do, during the real uh, surgery. And then there is a part here they call the dark matter of knowledge that is something that was unexpected and we will discuss later. Um, you know, here there are some of aspects of this top down and bottom up uh, knowledge representation, but I go to the example that makes things a little bit clearer. So what does it mean top down? It means that we have uh, the um, surgical procedures written in the textbooks, uh, textbooks for robotic surgery, of course, and we have to extract a, a, a computer program that can drive the uh, the motion of the robot and unfortunately the, well fortunately the surgical procedures are represented in sort of a semi-algorithmic form so you know we you can follow it very clearly on the other hand they're mixed the procedural and declarative knowledge uh, basically what you do and uh, how you do it and what are the constraints and another important point is that there are no um explicit mentioning of the conditions that uh, that are the the trigger certain action and they should be verified to terminate certain action these are assumed that the surgeon knows about it but you know they're not written in the textbook they're not the robot doesn't know them so how do we do and so you know we have trained uh, uh, generated a training data set you know we here to do this classification we use uh, uh, deep neural networks uh, we, we use a you will see later but the standard u-shape kind of network we generated a corpora of of uh, sentences that are all annotated so the so the network can learn the associated association between words and so we generate basically we get uh, we get uh, here at the end oh, a, a description of the procedure where we identify all the parts, all the verbs, what are what are the subject, what are the object, what the robot is uh, working on, and from this representation we can generate a series of actions for the robot. Uh, of course, as I said earlier, uh, there are a number of things that are not clear. They are not explained. That they are so assumed to be known by the person who is executing the, the intervention, but the robot is not is not aware of this of this uh, extension or this similarity or these uh, um, connections between different concepts. And so there is another thing that is important, which are the ontologies. The ontologies are large knowledge banks, uh, knowledge bases. It allows to make connection between concepts. Uh, uh, what, for, for instance, you have an instrument, it explains what this instrument can be uh, used for, what the instrument is made of, what are the parts on the instruments, how we use it. So these are the, the meaning of uh, or the context of ontologies. And so basically, if you have some concept or some word that is not clear, you have to access this, uh, this, these uh, potentially very large uh, knowledge base to get the information. Again, also this is sort of a uh, developing field and there's, I mean, keep in mind that what I'm, I'm telling you is just very preliminary search. You know, we are just scratching the surface of this uh, huge, huge problem. Then how do we represent this, uh, this, this uh, procedure, this pr program for the, for the robot? We have decided to use logical rules uh, which are some sort of not fashionable these days because now everybody talks about deep learning, neural networks and things like that. We, we use a logic uh, representation because first of all it's explainable and then because there is a formalism which is called ASP, uh, basically um, it's called answer programming set that allows to represent you see these actions with some uh, very explicit uh, logic uh, representation and also using variables that are directly related to the perception of the robot. So here you see an example. Uh, you see this is not is not a, a natural language representation, but it's not difficult to understand. You move from one place to the other, whether if the place is reachable, if the place is reachable, then you move and then you have something in the hand and, and so forth. 
So you know, you're able to understand what is going on. It's very easy to translate from this representation to an explanation to the surgeon. And what is important is all the parameters here are variable then can be uh, instantiated by the perception system. And here I, I point out that this is not what you, you read in the AI manuals these days. No, sort of is, is another approach, but again, it works very well. And uh, you see here, these are a simulation. Um, you know, all the, the simulation is easier, uh, but uh, we, we can we can see where the rings are, their position, their color, and these variables go into the uh, logic programs, and the robot, by verifying all the rules, decides what to do. And we can improve it by repeating this, of course, in simulation, because otherwise the robot will, will break to improve the, the rules that we design. Um, bottom up, we learn it from data. We have two ways to learn from data. We can learn the uh, division phases. So let's say you are doing a suture, you have to approach the tissue, you have to insert the needle in the tissue, you have to extract the needle from the tissue, you have to make a knot. These are the different phases of a, of a simple uh, task. And then within every phase, you know, how do you reach the tissue? How do you insert the needle in the, uh, in, in, in the tissue? Again, uh, basically you, you, you have to develop some sort of continuous model of, of your motion and your force uh, profile. So here we have a, which is called a hybrid representation where you have a discrete set of, of steps, which are the phases, and within every phase, you have a continuous model which describes the dynamics of your system. Mathematics is not very simple, you will see in a moment. So this is the sort of a graphical representation. We have the hybrid automaton, discrete components, continuous components, Remember, we are working from the data. We have no idea what the data represent. We have a time series of numbers. And this is a way that we could, one way that we could uh, uh, develop, uh, analyze this data. This is a hidden Markov model. And uh, you know, this is a, a thesis and two years of postdoc of, of one of my students. We get some results, but this is uh, you know, a, a very complex problem. And instead, a simpler problem is the modeling of the continuous part within each phase. And that, that motion can be represented by a set of differential equations. And the, the, the advantage of this approach is that it allows uh, to um, deform the motion, to scale it, to rotate it. So it allows you to work in an affine space Whereas uh, normal uh, uh, normal um, spline representation or other representation don't allow to do this very easily. This is how we get to the data. So you know here you see a simulator. Here you see the cooperative robot, and we have this uh, sort of learning. And then the final, the real data, which are, as you can imagine, are very very difficult to handle. Uh, when we have uh, this is an example, we have a trajectory done with the panda robot on the on the uh, left side of the screen, and the trajectory executed by the instrument of the Da Vinci robot. And you see that qualitatively they are similar. You know, sort of it looks pretty much the same. But look at the difference of scale. You know, the Da, the da Vinci uh, robot is. Uh, in a very mi minute scale, whereas the uh, panda robot moves on a larger scale. And here is the, 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 the two representations in, on the left, what we learn, and on the right, how the, the task is executed. So we can learn in a very comfortable, very large space for, for a human to teach the robot, and then it can modify it, uh, zoomed in and you know, shrunk to fit the actual workspace. Uh, what is the dark matter of knowledge? Well, uh, dark matter is, uh, you know, you know, is a sort of hypothetical form of matter that has never been proved in existence, but you know, which we think is, is there to account for all the, the the cosmic dynamics. In knowledge representation, according to some author, dark matter is common sense knowledge and reasoning. So when you talk with a surgeon. And you tell him, but you know, or tell her, uh, but you know, you know, the, the surgical textbooks uh, says this and this and that. And the answer is yes, of course, but you have to interpret it. You have to use your common sense, your experience 
to apply this to the uh, to the to the specific case. So really, we have no way to figure this out. You know what we are studying right now. What I've been telling you right now is just the tip of the iceberg. This procedure knowledge, but then there is a surgical common sense. You know that if you punch a vessel, there will be some bleeding. Then there is a medical common sense that the patient, uh, you know, the blood pressure, the breathing, I think like that. And then there is a general common sense that an object, you know, if you let an object uh, alone, it falls on the, on the ground, that there is a gravity, all the things. So, you know, this is a major problem because uh, really you need to adapt this um, the, the the knowledge that you extract from your for your textbook you need to adapt it to the specific case using this knowledge uh, this common sense knowledge and so we have the hypothesis that in order to achieve a high level autonomy we have to introduce a higher level of common sense you know for the autonomy level one or perhaps two we can get away with the surgical procedure description because there is all the surgeon interacting and can can modify what the robot does. But in general, you know, if we want to go to higher level, we have to include all these other levels of, of uh, common sense. Uh, key to this part is situation awareness. And uh, keep in mind that we have not addressing the contact. We are only addressing free motion because there are no sensors on the instrument or surgical instruments. And so we cannot measure the interaction forces between the instruments and the tissues. And uh, you know, this measurement allows us to fill in the variables on the logic programs that I mentioned to you earlier. This is an example. This is the structure that we've done. It's very simple structure. You will see a little bit more evolved uh, in, in, uh, in the next slides. And this is a small uh, example of this uh, autonomous execution of this task, peg and ring. This is the program, so very understandable. The, you know, here the robot dropped the ring, but the awareness system in, recognized that the, the ring was dropped, and so it uh, reacted. Here there was a, a peg that was covered. So first the, the peg was emptied and then uh, the other ring or the collar was uh, was uh, was moved. Uh, here it, it is able to control the two instruments uh, at the same time. They they are working in parallel. And then finally here you see an, an unexpected event. A ring is put into into the scene. The the situation aware models recognize it, and so the robot reacts. So this is all done autonomously without any human intervention, except the specification of the of the of the programs at the beginning. Of course, we have uh, uh, written this program uh, by hand, and now we are working on on getting this uh, logical condition, so the full combination of actions and logical conditions <coughs> developed autonom autonomous automatically, uh, given the uh, given the textbook. Uh, we are using simulation. Simulation can be used to, uh, of course, verify what, uh, verify the plan, verify the, the assumptions of the model, but can also be used, as you see here, some feedback <coughs> loop to be able to uh, check whether the model was correct, check whether the surgical plan was correct, and make the appropriate uh, corrections. And here is another example of this uh, learning. Uh, here it is on this learning. We have uh, here we are trying to learn a small part of a task, uh, autom autonomous lifting of uh, tissue, because we want to do some uh, um, more clinical relevant experiment, which is uh, partial nephrectomy, uh, removing a tumor from, from a kidney. And so one of the key parts is lifting a layer of fat that covers the kidney. And so this yellow thing simulates the layer of fat and the, the red thing is the kidney with the tumor. And you see, we are doing learning and the robot, of course, in simulation is trying to get the different, trying to get to the, to the right sequence. And of course, at the end of the day, we are able to get uh, the simulation to, uh, to perform correctly and the motions learned by the in the simulation are transferred to the robot and the two execute in parallel. Uh, 
um, you know, we have done, as you see, we have been using machine learning, you know, this uh, more modern approach to artificial intelligence in a number of situations. Here you see uh, how we are using neural network to simulate and to predict the motion of the, the motion of internal parts of a tissue subject to an external deformation. This is important when we want to, this was in the context of some uh, project on, on uh, breast biopsy. And really you want to know how the tumor inside the breast moves when the, the echographic probe deforms the breast. And so by uh, examining the, deform the outside deformation, we can predict where the tumor has moved and then have a more precise biopsy. And again, these are uh, here the, the, the key point. This was a thesis of uh, Eleonora Tagliabue, one of my uh, PhD students. The key point is to be able to combine uh, finite element simulations, which are accurate but very slow and not very suitable for real time use, train uh, to generate the training data for a neural network, which instead is very fast and can be used as a real time control for, for a robot. So you know, the combination of the two was a really a winning. Uh, sort of thought, and this is the processing pipeline that we have developed. And this BANET is what we use to uh, uh, interpret the deformation and, and get the, uh, the uh, internal, internal uh, tissue motion, the, the prediction of the internal uh, tissue motion. Uh, again, we have done other things on, on uh, <clears throat> simulation on, on uh, moving tissue, even in vivo experiments in Strasbourg, France. Uh, based on this, we have uh, developed another architecture. So you see the architecture gets more and more complex. And here the concept is that simulation is not just a tool to test or to develop our, or to uh, verify our plans, but it's actually the, uh, forgive me the term, but some sort of con consciousness of a robot the robot carries out the simulation in the background and has always this continuous verification between the ongoing simulation and the ongoing task and to see which one of the two is correct. And of course, the, the real task is the one that is the winning. And so, you know, the monitor can trigger either a support or a request for support to the human supervisor or some adaptation to the so simulation is really a tool for for autonomy is the background of all the autonomous tasks like like we are driving a car and we think uh, oh i drive this and i'll drive that and i'll turn this is basically a mental simulation that we are running and this running out and this is what uh, uh, the robot should also be doing um, you use uh, deep network as i mentioned to extract uh, uh, training data we have created and this you see again this is an example of this uh, network that was used to process this uh, corp or corporal data and identify of this uh, uh, the, the parts of the sentences which turns out to be far from trivial and fortunately as I, as I mentioned at the beginning this was a totally unexpected thing we didn't think that extracting knowledge from a textbook would have generated such an interesting research area. Here we are involving physiologists, we are involving, of course, to understand what uh, uh, what it happens, we are involving lexical experts, we are involving uh, a national language processing experts, and, and so it's, it's a very complex uh, multidisciplinary development that we are doing here. And this is uh, uh, how we are developing this uh, uh, using this network to extract extract the um, description of the text. And the neural network could also be used to complement analytical models because uh, you know, models of the robot are never really perfect. There are a number of factors that we are really not, uh, not aware of that um, we may never be able to measure. And so we are hoping that by, by uh, applying or integrating an analytical model with uh, some neural network, we are able to get a better uh, understanding of the model. We are still a little bit away. You see here, there are still differences in data, but this is one example in which uh, deep learning can actually be very helpful. 
And just to finish, I just mentioned how we are using this, all this technology to a real product. And we started a company just to be able to uh, commercialize this device. And this is the device. Uh, <clears throat> we choose uh, prostate biopsy because it is a very common procedure. Uh, it's very economic. It doesn't cost very much. And so it does not attract uh, the major robotic players, uh, medical robotic players in the market, but it affects the, at least just in Europe, a million and a half people, two millions in the US. And the, and the prostate cancer has about 350,000 deaths per year worldwide. So it's something that is worth addressing. And we want to make a, a robot that is able to achieve level one of autonomy, so be able to give cognitive and manual support to the to the operating uh, urologist. Cognitive support and be able to identify the target, identify the tumor, uh, doing the fusion of the images between the preoperative images, MRI, magnetic resonance images, and the ultrasound images that are done during the, the uh, examination and the biopsy. And then, of course, dexterity support because you think think about inserting a very flexible needle into the patient, and this is very tricky. You know, the needle deforms. Uh, you really are not able to control exactly the direction of the needle, and so this procedure is more than 30% uh, diagnostic error. And so all those 15 million and a half uh, people that undergo a prostate biopsy every year. 500,000 have a wrong biopsy. Either they have a false negative or, or they have a, they take the risk of being over-treated because the lesion is not that, uh, you know, because the urologist is not too confident of, of the results of the biopsy. So it says, okay, let's, let's go through a total prostatectomy, a radical prostatectomy, because, you know, just in doubt, let's take everything out. So, you know, there are a number of issues that we are trying to address with this, with this new device. And we have been doing cadaveric experiments and we are achieving, you know, a very reasonable accuracy of less than two millimeters of accuracy with the targets, which is what we would like to do because we want to address the uh, lesions that are less than five millimeters of diameters, which is the border between dangerous and, and non-dangerous uh, uh, lesions. And, uh, the other point is that uh, in five, ten years from now, all the procedures, all the um, prost prostate cancer uh, procedures will change, and 70% of the current surgeries will be transferred into focal therapy, minimal invasive, even further minimal invasive therapy. And uh, so, but in order to do that, you need to have a very accurate, very precise device to be able to do the focal therapy. So be able to go back, you sample a place, you have a positive uh, result of your biopsy, you return to the same place and you burn the tissue and you ablate the tumor. So this is what the, 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 the hope, the dream of all urologists would be able to do. So a patient enters in the clinic in the morning, gets the MRI, is, is tested positive, he gets the biopsy at the end of the morning, in the afternoon gets the treatment and he goes home cured. One day treatment, which will be the dreams of all urologists and all, all people, I think. And we are also developing a, on, on a side, a orthopedic uh, robot or, or a robot for orthopedic surgery, just to prove, well, you know, perhaps we will become a product, but just to prove that in six months, with uh, you know, less than 100,000 euros of expenses, we can develop a, a robotic device for surgery. And so, you know, trying to push the idea of doing something which is useful and low cost. And so to conclude, hopefully I haven't I've been within the timing. Uh, so, you know, remember that once you have a robotic device, then you can use it for a number of applications. For instance, in orthopedic uh, surgery, you have these devices that do very little for the time being, but they can be used to do the tendon balancing, can be used to do the assessing the, the, the density of the tissues, and all the things can be done by software. So the software, you know, think of Da Vinci. Right now, the Da Vinci is a teleoperated system, but they're starting including uh, image fusion, um, some, we are talking about virtual walls, we are talking about other um, 
guiding concept or guiding software or guiding applications, if you want, that can reduce the effort of the surgeon, can reduce the risk of errors. And all these are done by software because the hardware is right there, done by uh, simulation, are done by uh, graphics, are done by AI. So do not focus only on the mechanic aspect, but remember that you know for 10% investment in mechanic, 9% investment or cost is software. So you know think of that as your future career. And thank you for your attention. Fantastic. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thanks a lot for 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 presenting. Um, excellent overview and uh, yeah, how you kind of look at the current situation and, and link it to your work and, and make the, the very important point, how can we get to more uh, automatic, more autonomous systems uh, also in the surgical environment. And um, yeah, I mean, really excellent talk. Uh, I don't know really where to start. Maybe anyone else, uh, if anyone has a question, please do raise your hand. Um, otherwise, I will start with some questions. So really, when you speak about AI and machine learning, um, and you speak also about the rules and the, the, the common sense approach one, one, can, one can bring in, but everything should be explainable. But then you, you also use neural networks, you use machine learning. So how do you make sure everything is explainable? And especially considering it has to be safe and, and the, the medical industry, the surgical industry is so concerned you know, that everything is uh, safe because they don't want to kill anyone on the operating table. So how, yeah. how, do, you, how do you solve that problem? That, that, that's a very important point, Kasper. The, the the way I see is that uh, neural network, deep learning, all these technologies have a have a a, 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 have a use, a, you know, a very good use, when you address it in a sort of a small domain. For instance, uh, you know, here we've been using it. Uh, perhaps the, the word is not totally appropriate, but sort of virtual sensors. We are using as to detect uh, a, a position of a, or to estimate the position of something that we don't see. We use it to extract uh, some feature that are a combination of something, but we, we use it for a very small thing that can be uh, extensively tested and verified in, in, uh, in simulation and experiments. Uh, we have gone through a number of projects uh, uh, in which uh, other people were trying to use uh, deep learning to learn the complete procedure, to learn a complete sequence of tests, of tasks that didn't work. Uh, for instance, talking about common sense, there is a guy at Facebook that wants to develop this multi-billion parameter neural network that represents all the human common sense. Okay, good luck. Uh, I mean, I, I, first of all, this is going to be a huge effort, but then I, I don't think we ever be able to understand what it does. You know, it gets an answer, and who knows what it is. So, you know, if it is something in the small, then you have uh, a, a place for for learning, for you know, this motion, how to leave something, it's something that you can test, you can reproduce, you can uh, you know adapt with common uh, with common control systems, but not the whole sequence. Okay, so perception, obviously there I also agree, neural networks, black boxes can be used. Uh, I mean, computer mm -hmm. vision has been enormously successful for good reason. But now you're, and, and then you're saying you stay in, the, in a small kind of confined space, but you're also saying now, yes, we can use it for uh, certain motions. So you, you think that is already possible? Because, well, I mean, perception is one thing, actuation is, of course, the absolutely. real thing where we start, you know, um, contacting and, 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 and impacting on the environment. Well, that um, learning of, of uh, or I, perhaps I didn't say it, uh, well, I actually did not say it, but the, the local motion, you know, the, the learning from data, you learn the steps through this uh, humongous uh, Markov uh, setup, but then the small no motions are actually learned. 
the, the uh, differential equation that I show you, the parameters can be learned with a, a, another network kind of approach. And so you learn the motion. And then again, it's a differential equation. We can prove that it's converging. That is, uh, so, so you learn some certain parameters. For instance, in the mode that I presented you, we have the basic dynamic model, which does not work or it, it has some, so we make the difference between the data and the prediction of the model. We have a, a, a sort of a, an error, a layer, and we use the network to try to identify that part. So the integration of the two can be very, very useful and, and very good at the end. Yeah, and I, I, I completely agree. I mean, especially when we have analytical models, we have a good understanding of the world through physics. Um, but then the moment you, and, and I think that's good to use. I mean, wh wh why ask your network to learn everything from scratch? That is crazy. I totally agree. Exactly. But, exactly. but the, the moment you, you move away from that well-defined physical model and add your, and, and, and try to resolve the error with your neural networks, you, you go into a kind of a vague zone, which... Uh, okay, I agree, but you know, well, that's... Not, not the that's what, that's what you, you you have anyway, you know, how do you represent friction or elasticity in cables? So you, you really don't have a good analytical model, or perhaps you can use an analytical model, but then identify the parameters. So, you know, use it wherever we can, uh, wherever we don't, we are not able to get an equation out of it. And uh, you know, equations are perhaps uh, to simplify the model. The, the, the word is much more complex than the simple equation. And perhaps we can integrate the two. But as I said, you said, you know, why throw away the the, the, the knowledge of hundreds of years of studies? You know, exactly, exactly. Um, I like your your logic rules. Um, they are explainable. I mean, I, I I worked a long time ago in fuzzy logic, and I would really very much like to go back to it again because it is explainable. You can apply proofs to make sure that, you know, within certain constraints, yeah, you, you have stability. Um, but then on the other hand, I mean, I, I appreciate you, 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 can ex, you can show it works in, in, in these environments that you have chosen. But what happens if we go now into the complex environment of a, of a human body? Um, and, and we have those images coming from there that are totally crazy. I mean, I look at them, I don't understand anything. And luckily there's a surgeon who is, you know, carrying out the operation and they know exactly what they're doing. But how can we now, you know, achieve uh, in such a complex environment to find a good solution for a robot to do something? No, that is that's an open question. The the experiment that we'll be, we are developing or we are trying to do is to do, as I said, a, a partial nephrectomy, so lifting a tissue, um, uh, some blunt blunt cutting or some. Perhaps we'll add a little bit of red liquid that looks, uh, you know, that confuses a bit of the, the the field. But again, we are far away from the real the, the real environment. So you know, that's, that's an open question. Perhaps again, you know, this neural network come back again and will provide some solution. Uh, but you know, since I'm a little older than you, I I, I lived through the, the first wave of neural networks <laughs> that I mentioned all the time in the in the in the early 90s. And they seem to solve everything, and then they disappeared. So oh, uh, you know, back. yeah, no, they they come back. Yeah, they and, come back. And, and I I saw you I, I saw you are using BERT, B E R T, so the the new uh -huh. transformer thing. So what's your view on those? Because I mean, I I just started hearing about them, and I'm fascinated by it. I, but I don't have a real understanding yet. But what they can do in the in the, in the language field is just amazing. So do you think they can help there and maybe also go beyond it and help in, in other areas like uh, robotics for surgery? Could be, could be. Actually, we, we developed a, a, we made a small addition. We, well, there is also, also BERT, there is something called clinical BERT, which is uh, specified for clinical application. And we extend it a little bit to, to clinical surgical uh, uh, Bert. In fact, uh, one of the of the pictures that I showed you, but you you will see later on. I want to I don't want to go back. Is that we developed a a, a corpora of, of uh, words to be able to do this training. 
Yes, but uh, you know we are dealing with uh, they will have a, a, a place. They will bring some some useful tools, but they are addressing. Uh, we are addressing a very specific field, which is uh, not addressed by bird nor by clinical birds. And so you know we, there is a linguistic part that has to be done uh, just to to develop the, the basic knowledge of. of for instance, I, one of my students she has been spending weeks to identify all the meaning of the word away, because uh, in, in, in surgery, uh, in a, in, oh no, sorry, the word along uh, means, uh, you know, you, you're following a path or you're going along with somebody or we are, so there are like five or six meanings and each one is different in the context of a different surgery. And, and how do we, you know, this is a mixture of linguistic and common sense and how do we represent that? So you, you are trying to train something like BERT or clinical BERT yourself, you know, because my understanding is many, these things are kind of pre-trained and people are just using them. for Exactly, the but, but usually there is a room for specialization. So they have a basics of, of pre-trained and then, you know, I don't do anything. I, I barely know what a neural network is, but I have a very good uh, PhD student that yeah. is working on that and is, yeah, is, uh, and is working with linguistics and then uh, people that are doing the work. Yeah, yeah. So. fantastic. Yeah. No, thank you very much again. Um, no one uh, dares to ask a question. Yeah, Everybody is uh, looking for lunch now. <laughs> probably, yeah. Although it's only 12 o'clock here in the UK. But yeah, no, fantastic uh, presentation. Um, very good to listen to and also very good to see you again. And I will see you in five minutes, I suppose. Uh, well, give me five more minutes. I'll grab something to eat it and I'll, I'll join the meeting. No worries. Well, thank you very um, much, Casper. Thank you for everybody to listen, uh, to be patient to, to my to my topics, and I uh, hope to see you soon in person. Thanks a lot. All the best. Okay. Yeah. See you later. Goodbye. Bye bye. And that concludes everything. Bye bye, everyone.